Inhale. <coughs> Inhale. <coughs> so we're going to pray for Brother Jeff, who's going to be teaching class this morning, for supporting him. We're going to pray for Brother Curtis Nolan, who's gone to Florida to preach there. We're also going to be praying for our monthly offering. Lord, I ask that you strengthen Jeff and anoint him to teach, and for Brother Nolan for his teaching and anointing in Florida, and give him safe travels to and from. I ask that you bless this offering. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. yesterday while I was in San Francisco and I was thinking about today's, I was wrestling with, with trying to decide what I wanted to teach everybody today. And uh, everything that I that came to my mind was good and I had some good ideas and I was praying that God would give me the exact thing I wanted to speak, he wanted me to teach today. So um, we were going to talk about the Holy Ghost, or I was going to talk about baptism in Jesus' name, I was going to talk about uh, the Word of God. So I was kind of struggling with different topics of what I wanted to teach. And I was thinking about the Godhead, and I was really praying about it. And I was at, uh, it's a grand coffee shop, and I was thinking about it. And I was praying, trying to feel what God wanted. And I felt good on this one topic. So I'm going to go ahead and teach about the Godhead today. And, I, you know, there's the fatherhood, there's what, what he does, and there's motherhood, what she does, but there's also what's called the Godhead. Uh, thank you for praying, Brother Kadito. I really appreciate it. I appreciate God's anointing, and I want to please God, and I want, I'm not trying to please everybody here, I'm trying to please God, and that's what's the most important thing. The Word of God is precious, and I want everybody to understand it. Mm -hmm. And you have to read this Bible carefully. You can't twist it or make your own uh, uh, interpretation of it. So you have to really rub the Word of God. You have to read it to understand it and share it with each other and to help each other understand it. So I want to emphasize this part with the Godhead. I'm sure most of you already know and some of you, this is repetitious, I know, but this, you'll still benefit from it. I mean, you read it over and over every day, and you love the Word of God. You never get sick of the Word of God. It's for our inspiration. And I want to emphasize this part right here. God, can you see this clearly? Great. Okay. So I know uh, if it's a black wall, it's a little bit different. And the other room was a little different, but this is having a white wall. Ah! Okay, you can read this clearly, that's great. Okay, so Jesus is speaking here, you notice the letters read, and this is in John chapter 4, verse 24. And it says, and he's emphasizing this, and he says, God is a spirit. This means you cannot see God, he's a spirit. Each one of us here, we're flesh and blood. We're human. We have skin and bones. You can see us. But God is a spirit. And you can't see him. It's like the air. You can't see the air. And you have to remember that God is a spirit, which means he's everywhere at the same time. 
And the verse goes on to say, and they that worship him, this is God, this, this hymn is referring to God. Remember, it says God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit. And you know how, how you do this is like when you're praying yeah. and you clear your mind of, of your daily activities and you focus on him. And all the negative things in your life, you just stop focusing on it. You know, you, you're, your mind, you're always thinking about what happened in the past and all that. But you've got to put that aside. And you must worship him in spirit and in truth. So you all have a soul. Each one of us has a soul. And you know your soul is in you. You have your flesh is all this imagination, your your inner twirl, but you have a spirit and you have a soul. One day you're gonna meet God. So right now you feel like you're you're trying to connect with God and your spirit is trying to connect with God. Uh, some of you haven't yet tasted the Holy Ghost. You haven't yet had the Holy Ghost. Uh, that's for me too. I love getting the Holy Ghost. I love being in the Spirit of God. It is so sweet. It's so inspiring. So it says you must worship in spirit and in truth. That means you gotta believe that God is real, that God is true. So you know I'm not perfect. I have my mistakes, but yeah, and I'm not talking about playing around and doubting in the world, you know. Uh, when you worship him, you must worship him in spirit and in truth. And then if you notice, it says, they that worship him. This is the cycle of worship. Means you're standing up, you're praising God, dancing, whatever. Just you're giving him worship. And you're thanking him. And that's what the worship means. But it says you must worship him in spirit and in truth. <sighs> and this word, a conception of God. Explain this point. <clears throat> and Psalms 139, verse 7 says, and this is David writing this psalm here. And God knows where you are. God knows where he is. And he says, Whether shall I go from thy spirit? Or whether shall shall I flee from thy presence? Which means so either I leave your spirit or I flee from you. God is there. No matter where he goes, God is there. And the next verse says, and David says, If I ascend up into the heavens, thou art there. You're there. No matter where I go, you're there. He knew that. He says, If I make my bed in hell, that means if he's in the grave, or in other words, is go down into the depths of the earth. So if I go down to the depths of the earth, if I travel all the way down through the earth, I cannot escape from your presence. You are still there. It says right here, it says, Behold, thou art there. So David knew that God's a spirit. He's everywhere. So no matter what, if he digs down to the depths of the earth or he goes out into space, no matter where he goes, God is there. God is already there. God's a spirit. He is everywhere at once. And the next verse says, If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. So David knew if I, if I could fly like a bird, or maybe it was a plane, if I, but if I could... A sin in this guy is like a bird. You're there. And the next verse says, mm. Even there shall thy hand. <coughs> so when you're flying through the air, the, understand, God's a spirit. It's like the air. It says, Thy hand shall lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. And the right hand represents power and authority, right? So God is leading you and God is everywhere at the same time. No matter where you go, if whether you try to hide, you, you, there's no way you can hide from God. God's spirit. So God knows where you are. He knows your thoughts. He knows everything about you. You cannot hide from God. 
So God can see everything. So God, God knows where you are. So it doesn't matter if you fly to the moon, God is still there. And verse 11 says, and David, and he's, he's saying this, he says, if I shall say, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the <coughs> night shall be light about me. So like the Lord, is, 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 it's in dark, and even though you're in the darkness all around you, there's still that light. Verse 12 says, Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee. So he's still that light. He can still see. Even though it's dark all around you. But he says, The darkness hideth not from thee. But the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are like thee. So the darkness... You can't grab a hold of the darkness, but if you can't move in the darkness, but in the light you can move on. So you have to have that light, and God is a light unto us. And so like at night when you have a candle, you can see it. So, and then the, so in the sun, and during the day you have the sun shining and you can see where you're going. Well, God, he conquered the darkness. The verse 13 says, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. So God had already, from his mother's womb, he knew his name. God was already there. The verse 14 says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. So he's emphasizing that God is a spirit here. And we must worship him in spirit and in truth. So he is saying, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And this fear is not fear as in uh, being afraid, but it is more of a, a, a honor and, and wonderfully made. For marvelous are thy works. So he made everything. He made the birds, the, the sky. He made everything. And he knew you and he made you. He said, marvelous are thy works. And that my soul knoweth right well. So my soul worships God because he is awesome. So we have to understand who God is. God is a spirit. And God is everywhere, no matter where we go, no matter what country we fly to, no matter if we fly to the moon or, or tunnel down into the earth, God is there. So we honor him, and he is incredibly awesome. My next point here is Jesus had all power. Jesus has all power. All power. Not just some power, but he had all power. Matthew 28, verse 18 says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, and this is to his disciples, he was talking to them and he said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So Jesus had all the power. So it means he can control everything in heaven because he had all the power there and he could control everything on earth because he had the power here. And this power is he had the authority. The meaning that Jesus could make decisions to change heaven if he wanted to. He could change the earth if he wanted to. He had full authority. He had whatever he wanted to change, he could do it. He had the full authority. <coughs> so it says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. The next verse, 28, 19 says, he's telling all, all the disciples, all the apostles, he's telling them, and I'm kind of here, it's not quite 12 here. 
He's telling them, he said, first of all, he said, I have all powers given unto me in heaven and in earth, which you have to understand who, we, who, who Jesus is. And Jesus had all the authority and power. Hands. Yes. There you go. And he told them, he said, Go ye therefore, teaching all nations. That means everywhere. In Africa, in Mexico, in Vietnam, in the Philippines. He said, Go throughout the whole world. It doesn't matter what, what color your skin is, what race you're from. It says, go to teaching all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father. But notice, we have to explain, there's a lot of explanation on this. But it says name, there's, it's singular, it does not have an S on it. It's singular, it says baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. These titles, it's all in one. It's, it's all in the name of Jesus. Because Jesus had all power given to him in heaven and in earth. And, he, and it's the name. So the Holy Ghost is everywhere. The Father is everywhere. Besides, it, Jesus, he's the Father, and on earth he was a son, and in between was the Holy Ghost. But those all three, it's all in him. It's just one name, and was the name of Jesus. And he went on to say, teaching him to observe all things, being careful, Observing all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So when he was telling them, he'd been with you for three and a half years, and he was teaching them. Remember, everything that I told you, you need to cherish, and you need to value everything that I've taught you. This has all been for an example for you. Whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And Jesus said, I am. I will not be with you always. You need to trust in me and use that knowledge to spread the gospel. What I taught you, spread the gospel to the world. So the word observe means to carefully uh, uh, look at something, to carefully So remember, he's talking to the 12 apostles and he's teaching them and he's telling them that they need to be careful and observe all things that he's teaching them. So he said, everything that I've been teaching you, whatsoever I have commanded you. So everything up to this point, what he's taught them, they need to keep it and observe it. So it's like this word of God. You know, God, Jesus ascended, but he left his word here with for us. And we have to read his word. This is his word. We need to carefully observe it. Carefully read it. And we're not just making up our own thoughts and opinions. but we're And we're not just taking out one verse. But we're what we have to do is study the word and share it with each other. So we have to meditate on his word all day. So that is correct. So we're supposed to read this word and meditate on his word and think about it and cherish it. This word is important. It has value to our life. So we should cherish this word. And we should also share it with one another and, and share this truth with other people. It's not just for ourselves. <coughs> so I like what the third verse says. Where he's teaching and the I-N-G means to continue teaching. You don't stop. It's continuing to teach. And then observe means all things mean whatsoever I've commanded you. It's everything that's written in the Bible. So he's teaching them. And, and they said you have to continue unto the ends of the world. <coughs> that's right. His word. It says teaching them to observe. It's continuing to teach them. So when you read this word, you are still learning. You're still, he's still continuing to teach you. <coughs> until the ends of the world. So that's when the rapture takes place. The end of the world is when the rapture happens. So we, communication is important. And you communicate with his word. Communicate with him. That is important. Amen. 
So my point today is that, I know I'm going down a rabbit trail a little bit, but uh, I was talking about the Godhead, who God is, and that Jesus has all power, and we all know that God has power, so some people get confused about Jesus and God, but there's only one God, and Jesus is God, because it says he had all power in heaven and earth. So it's, so it's important to know who God is. So we don't have all power in heaven and earth. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people believe that, um, like Casey loves the weather, and he loves studying that, and if he, he can't control the weather, um, mm -hmm. he doesn't have the authority or the power, but God can control the weather. God has all power, and he's, for, for all these years, I know I'm going off a rabbit trail here, but we can't control the heavens and the earth. We can't. But only Jesus had all power to control the heavens and the earth. Until he decides to rapture his church. He, so one day we'll be raptured with him, and we don't want to stay with this world. Is it, this part says, and lo, I am with you always. So there's mm -hmm. only one God. He says, lo, I am with you always. It's not two. He doesn't say we are with you always. There's only one God. So it's, yes, it says, lo, I am with you always. Yes, that is correct. And then Isaiah, this is in the Old Testament. This is Isaiah. And, you know, the Jewish, the Jewish people, they all believe in one God. They don't believe there's more than one. Uh, and then Isaiah, this is a prophecy. He's writing this down. He's writing what will happen. And it's Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. It says, For unto us a child is born. It says, A, a child is born. For unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And this is this his is referring to the child. The government shall be upon his child, and this is Jesus that they're talking about. This child is Jesus that they're talking about. So the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called, and this is Jesus. He's wonderful, right? So these two words, wonderful, counselor. Jesus is wonderful. He's the wonderful counselor. He's the best counselor we'll ever have. He's better than any counselor in this world. I mean, we have uh, different counselors uh, available. Um, AA, we have AA, we have uh, yeah. STEP programs that try to help people get over their addictions. And maybe, the, uh, maybe they have different pro pro programs to help people. But they're not going to be as successful. And the people that are alcoholics, often they fall, they fall back into it. But Jesus, he was the wonderful counselor. And when you get that Holy Ghost, and talk, God touches you, and he changes your life. Because my background, my life story, it was, uh, it was it's God knows my business. Yeah. It's not none of your business, but God knows my life. He knows my background. He knows what's on the inside of me. And when you get the Holy Ghost, God changes you. He is the wonderful counselor. So if we're a sinner in the world, when the Holy Ghost comes in, the sinner doesn't have that much influence on you. So um, I went. To, I was at a Catholic church before, and I went to a priest, and you know, I and I, I um, respected him as a man. And a priest asked me to confess my sins, and me and my ignorance, I, I you know confessed my sins to him, and the priest listened to me. And he asked if there was anything else I wanted to confess, and so I would, you know, confess more to him, and 
and he would pray that I would be forgiven. But on the inside, I felt no change. When I left, I'd go back out and do the same old thing. There was no power for forgiveness there. But it was until I got into a Pentecostal church where I really understood that I could have a relationship with God myself. So God who can forgive each and every one of us. Our just, give it to God. just give it to God and let him do it. So God is the spirit. We just worship him in spirit and truth. And Amen. we confess our sins to him and we ask God to help us and to forgive us. And God understands and he will help you. And through the Holy Ghost, when you speak in that new language, your heart becomes cleansed. And then your life will improve from there. And he is the wonderful counselor. And he is the mighty God. So the Jewish people believe that there is one powerful God. And they trust that there is only one. But and the, it goes on saying he will be the everlasting father. So Jesus is the everlasting father. He is the prince of peace. So in seven years... During the, oh, when he comes down yes. during that break, seven when he years. takes over, there'll be peace during those seven years. Of, mm -hmm. There'll be tribulation, mm -hmm. tribulation mm -hmm. before that, and when he comes mm -hmm. up, peace, peace. So Jesus mm -hmm. is called the Wonderful Counselor. He's a mighty God. But uh, if you look up here, it says a child is born, and this is he's talking about Jesus here. So Jesus mm -hmm. had all power. He was the mm -hmm. mighty God. He's the right hand of God also. And yeah, the right hand of God simply means the authority, the power. It's not uh, a person that's standing on the other, on the right hand. Uh, I can explain that another time, but the right hand simply means power and authority. So there's only one name. There's only one name. That's mentioned all these what he does but it's only one name so these are just his titles that they use to show his what he does his characteristics to him. yeah take away, the, take away the comma it's take away the counselor. comma would be one of the counselor but these are all like basically like titles mm -hmm. so it said he shall be called so, so first you have a son, a child is born, and you give him a name. It's, it's I mean, like you guys have uh, different titles. You have you're a father, you're a son, you're a, an interpreter. You're a, you have different titles for what you do. So same with Jesus. He was a counselor, the, the mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. But it's just one name that he has, and that's Jesus. My next point is, besides me, there is no God. So if you notice this red lettering here, and it's because, uh, let me see this Bible. I have this King James Version Bible, and at home I have a King James Version Easy Reader. And the King James Version Easy Reader, K-J-V-E-R, it means it's King James Easy Reader Bible. And the difference is, if you notice in the Old Testament, it also has red lettering. So this is this shows all the places where the Lord is speaking in the Old Testament. So I kind of like this easy reader because it shows the differences of who's speaking. Uh, so this is the Lord speaking in Isaiah 43, verse 10. It says, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servants whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be any after me. So God is a spirit. There's only one, one spirit. 
So Jesus said, I had all power in heaven and in earth. But I'm going to emphasize this part here. It says, and, uh, I am Yahweh. It says, I am He. We said that I am He. And before me, there was no God formed. So there's no other God besides me. Neither shall there be any after me. It goes, the next verse says, I, even I, am the Lord, Yahweh. And beside me, there is no Savior. And verse 12 says, I have declared and have saved and I have shown when there was no strange God among you. Therefore, ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Notice it says, I am the Lord, I am God. I am the Lord, Yahweh, I am God. And Isaiah 43, 13 says, Yea, before the day was, I am He. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? So God was speaking here, and there's, he said, there's no God beside me, none before me, none after me. He says, God, we need to be on him. He said, No, he said, God, we need to be on him. Oh, God. So Jesus said, Jesus is God himself. He said, I am he. And I'm, I'm emphasizing this point that God said that there's none other beside him, none before him, none after him. I'm the only savior, I'm the only deliverer. I'm the only one. There's none before me or after me, just one God. So right now he is saying, uh, this is in the Old Testament, remember this is in Isaiah, and he's focusing on, in the Old Testament, during this time of his Isaiah, he's writing down the prophesied, prophecy, Yes, so he's saying there's there is none other besides me. I am Elohim. I am. There's there's none beside me, none behind me, none none and before after me. So you are my witnesses that I am the only one. In Isaiah 43, 11, it says, I, even I am. Am is a continuing verb. It means a continues, it never stops. So when he says, I am the Lord, and beside me there is no other, he's saying that it continues, it never changes, it continues, the Lord is one. There is never beside me. Never. That's right. So I am, it didn't say I was, it says I am, which goes on infinitely. Amen. I agree with both of you. That is great. Um, so there's only done, no other God, just one. And that is awesome. That is incredible to think about. So Jesus said, I had all power in heaven and earth. Uh, the Trinitarians, or the, the Trinity belief, they believe that they are three separate, <coughs> three separate entities, and they are co-equal. But I don't believe in that because of what this word says. The Charitarians believe that the titles are forever. Uh, so, so, so. There's uh, no flesh, no fleshly father. But if you look here, it says, beside me, there is no Savior. If you believe in the Father, and it's at the right hand of God, okay? If you believe in the Father, and at the right hand of God is in Jesus, so the Father would be at the left. He doesn't say at the left hand of God. It, it, yeah. There's, there would, it would be impossible. But he said, there are no gods beside me. So if, it's, if the Son is on the one side of you, 
then you would have to think about, okay, you say there's none beside me, and, it, and you realize it doesn't say us in the Bible. It says there's only one God, and it says I. So I don't believe in the Trinitarian doctrine. So we are to teach and help and show people this truth. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6 says, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and this is this Lord in all caps is Yahweh, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord, which again, the, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, and beside me there is no God. So there's no competition in heaven. Amen. So, I mean, you know, here we have competition. You got first place, second place, third place, and on from there. Uh, like in, in a race, you're in a competition, right? Uh, so you like, if you're, you're, there's somebody that's first, and there's somebody that's going to be the last. But he said, there is no first. I am the first, and I am the last. No and there. beside me, there is no God. So he's emphasizing that there's only one God. There's no one else. So... At the end of the world, it's still going to be the same. Only one God. There's no God beside me. And verse 7, mm. <laughs> Brother Kadita loves this one God. It says, And who as I shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come and let them show unto them. So he's proving that there's only one God here. And, and shall come and show them unto you. So he picks his people. And verse, uh, verse four, uh, 8 says, Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee that from that time, and have declared it, Ye are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. So God is truth. And his word is the truth. And there are, he, his word never lies. He cannot lie. So we believe everything that God says. He says, I don't know any. And he tells the truth. Some people, they don't know. They deny it and they get confused and they lie about it. But... You can't, this is in the word of God. Uh, you can't deny this. I mean, uh, he says, I, there's none other beside mm -hmm. me. I know not any. So the Trinitarian belief is a lie. Some people believe in two gods. Some people believe in many. The God of trees and animals. And so there's many, many different beliefs. But this one God. Emphasize this to Israel, and then he showed us through Jesus. That's right. So, and this is, and Isaiah is prophesying. He's, he's talking to the Jewish people. He's talking to Israel. He's the king of Israel. And he said, "There is no other god beside me." Some people believe in two or three gods or more, and that is not the truth. That is garbage. My next point in Isaiah chapter, it says, mm. as God, the Father of Jesus. <laughs> in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as mm. his mother, Mary, was is Faust, which is engaged, to Joseph before they came together, so before they were one, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So notice this, we're told, we'll, we'll go back to that in a minute, and verse 19 says, then Joseph, her husband, being just a man, 
So he was a human, he was human. He was just a man, he was human. And not willing to make her a public example. He was minded. So, I mean, you know, some people have thought, oh, she's pregnant, she got pregnant before they got married or whatever. So he thought, of, he, was, he was thinking about her, uh, being mindful. He, he didn't want her to be punished. So, yeah. so and he knew that the Holy Ghost overshadowed her, but it was it was strange. You know, people would think that she cheated, and so he, he thought about, he was mindful about putting her away privately. And verse 20 says, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take to thee Mary thy wife, for that. He said, he said go ahead, take her to become your wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So Joseph understood at this point that this was the Holy Ghost. So they went ahead and got married. Now the Jewish people, they would notice that she was pregnant already and it would be a shame unto her and it would destroy her reputation. So he went ahead and married her now. And then the next point here is God the Father of Jesus. The Trinitarians believe that God the, there's God the Father. They don't believe that he the Father. They believe that he's there. That he's not. So. So Mary. And those who believe in, in Trinitarians, there's if you could think, there's a Holy Ghost, there's a Son, and then there's a Father, right? This is a Trinitarian belief. Okay, and then uh, Mary. How could she become pregnant by the Holy Ghost if if there were if the Trinitarian beliefs were true? So Joseph married her, and I mean you would assume that he, he would be her father or the the, the the child's father, but the God is the father. Oh, <laughs> So most people believe that God is the Father because Father is the is the normal um, person who would be the the father and the mother of the child. However, it says here that the Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary, and she became pregnant with the child. So therefore, Father is the same as Holy Ghost or interchangeable in this. Okay. So, but what really happened was the Holy Ghost overshadowed her. Meaning that the Holy Ghost and the Father are one. And the next point is Emmanuel, God with us. So in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, 18, 19, and 20, he's talking about the Holy Ghost, which is Jesus. As Jesus. So Matthew chapter 1, verse 21 says, and he's talking to Joseph still, and the angel's saying, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. And notice, for he, which is meaning Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So this is his people. Because Jesus, he's the creator of all things. So he created everything. He created Adam in his own image. There was no other God beside him, only him. He created Adam in his image. These are my people. These are my people. And they were lost, and I want to bring them back to my fold. I want them to reconnect with me. So the second Adam had to be born to, to reunite his people. And verse 22 says, Now all of this was done 
that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, so remember, this was prophesied long ago. And it says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So God is with us. God with us. It means Jesus. He's, he's, he's with me now. I can shake his hand. I can see you. I can connect with you. God with us. God walked among us. It's not God. It doesn't say God. God. Yeah, it doesn't say God's. It's singular. <coughs> it says one. God with us. So, and remember, there's no God beside him. But when Jesus is born, it says, it's God with us. <coughs> so I really want to drive this point in. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. No, two? Does it say two? The Lord our God is two lords? Mm. No. It is one Lord. Why do people believe in two or three gods? It clearly says, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God, Yahweh, with all thy heart. And the Bible says one God 53 times, and it never, not one time, says Trinity. Never. That's right. There is no mention in the Bible about the Trinity. <laughs> Many people say that uh, rapture. The rapture is mentioned in the Bible. Uh, that one word, rapture, is, is it's in the Bible. Does it does it does it actually say the word rapture in the Bible? Taken away. It actually says taken away, but does it say the word rapture? Somebody says yes. Some says no. Okay. The rapture, uh, taken away, many people say yes, there's the word taken away, but the actual word rapture is not in the Bible. Oh. That word is not found in the Bible. So Trinitarians try to prove, like the priests will try to prove this point, but the one word, it's a concept of the church being taken away at the rapture. So rapture simply means to be taken up, to be taken away. So the sinners often misunderstand what that means. So the, again, I'm going to say the word rapture, it means to be taken away, right? Yeah, taken up. But if you re read the Bible, you won't find that word in the Bible. But they do use the phrase taken up. And where's that first found at? Thessalonians. Thessalonians. It's also in the Yeah. Yes. Is it carried away? Or? That's like three verse two. But that's one chapter one, I think. Does anyone remember where it's at in First Thessalonians? That verse? Okay, while they're, well, they're looking for that. Then we'll find it. Okay. Mm. But the rapture is a verb. It's an action. So most of the time, mm -hmm. action is explained. Mm -hmm. But God is a noun, a person. So a person is like um, specific. So specifically, for God, Jesus, name, specific. But 
Rapture is an action, so it's explained. So it's different. We're not using together the same. First. Okay, so First Thessalonians chapter four, verse sixteen. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse sixteen says, <laughs> "Say the Lord Himself shall come down with a shout so and the voice the and of the, the archangel." And, and, and those that are dead in Christ shall be raised first, and they that which are alive and remain shall be caught away, or caught up <laughs> with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and we shall be with the Lord. So First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, so it says to be catch up, we will be caught up. So that is the same thing as the rapture. It's just me. Mm. So the Trinitarians believe that uh, they have the wor- that the word rapture is not in the Bible, and they will argue and and say it's the same thing with the word Trinity, because Trinity is not mentioned in the Bible. But rapture, the concept of the rapture to be caught away, is written and documented in the Bible. But there's no documentation or proof about Trinitarian belief, about three mm-hmm. months. So I went down this rabbit trail, but uh, the verse, phrase, this verse says, I shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart mm-hmm. and with all thy soul and with all thy might. So you have to fully love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and might. And there's only one God. I mean, the verse above it says, Hero is the Lord our God is one Lord. And that is so important. And John chapter 1, verse 1 here. It says, In the beginning was the word. And notice, this this is a Greek word that means logos. means thought, word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. So in the beginning... Thought was already there. Logos was already there. The Word was with God. And the Word was God Himself. So God had a plan from the very beginning. And verse 2 says, The same was in the beginning with God. So God made everything. God said, Let there be light. And it was His Logos. It was His thought. And, And there it appeared. As God spoke, the light was created from His mind. And God, and all things were made by him. Everything, not just some things, but all things were made by him. And without him, and notice it says him, only one. And without him was not anything made mm. that was made. <laughs> so without him, there wouldn't be anything here. So it was God that made it all. In him was life. So without God, we would have no life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness. <coughs> so like the sun, uh, if, you, if this is a light of mine, if you burn out that light, no one will see it. But you've got to let your light shine. You've got to keep that light shining. But it says, uh, the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. So they're out in their sin and out in the darkness doing their own thing. And they're in darkness. They don't understand what they need. They don't understand that they were born in a sin. They need that light to shine in their life to show them that they are a sinner. To show them that they need to follow that light. Because without that light, they are lost. They need to understand there's only one. And the verse says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Okay. So this uh, John, this is talking about John the Baptist here. Uh, next verse says, the mm-hmm. same came for a witness to bear witness of that of the light. So he's talking about Jesus here, that all men through him might believe. 
So he's showing everybody here. So you can believe in him or not. It it's all up to you. But it says he was not that light. So John says he was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. So he's here to tell people about it. He said, I am not worthy. I baptize you into repentance, but there's one that's coming after me. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Mm. He said, that's he. That's the one, the light. That's the one that will save you. So God had a plan, and he had a witness to introduce him to the world. He said, that was the true light, which lighted every man that cometh into the world. Mm -hmm. So the darkness did not understand. They don't know what, who, what, who, they, who he is. But when they see that light, and they, sh they are shown that light, they will know. And it says, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew not. But he made everything. God made everything. He made each and every one of, the, uh, of these people. But this per next part says, and the world knew him not. So the world, they didn't believe in God. They didn't understand who he was. Mm -hmm. They could see clearly, but they didn't understand who he was. It says, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. But notice, it says, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. So when you reconnect with God, when you're born again and you connect with God, your gift gives you power to become the sons of God, even to them that are that believe on his name. So this is all talking about one God here. This is all referring to one God. And the Trinitarians misunderstand this verse, these verses, yes. This is all pointing to one God. John 1, verse 3, can you show that? So the person who believes not in God, in 1 John chapter 3, oh, I see that, in John chapter 1, verse 3, it says, all things were made by him. All things were made by him, only one, one person, him. <gasps> I'm almost finished, if you don't mind holding this for me. So in John, so John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, And the Word was made flesh. Remember, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Word Became, he became flesh and lived among us. So this was, remember, this was God with us. He lived among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten Father, full of grace and truth. So remember, all these verses here, all the way down to verse 14, if you were to study at home, this is your homework. Study this at home. Thank you, Lord. I know there's another verse too about the mountains and the trees. Uh, but what is this right here where it says believe on his name? It's Jesus. <laughs> but remember that the verse 14 where it talks about he became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, but there's all these verses that make mention of him, one God. Verse 3 says, all things were made by him. Yeah. Jesus made everything. He made, it's not just some things that he made, but he made all things. Everything that we have, he made. The animals, the trees, everything. All things were made by him. 
And there's only one God. Him is singular. And that is referring to Jesus. It was talking about Jesus here. He said, without him was not anything made that was made. So remember, This word here, Emmanuel, which is being interpreted, is God with us. God is a spirit. Remember, we talked about that in the beginning. God is a spirit. And we must worship him in spirit and in truth. And then, remember, in the beginning was a word, word was with God. And remember, he spoke the word and things came into existence. And he became flesh and dwelt among us. For example... And then um, in Matthew 1, verse 21, it says, He shall save his people from their sins. So he saved each and every one of us. It's really God made Adam. He was the first Adam, right? He made Adam and he fell, right? Mm. The second Adam, and I think it's 1 Corinthians somewhere in there, it talks about the first Adam. And the last Adam was well, really like the second Adam, but uh, it was quick in the spirit in the, the second Adam. It was so that we could reconnect with God again. So God made Adam in his image. He made Adam. He formed him. And he had communion, and that was his. They had that connection together. But then he sinned and fell, and there was a separation. They were separated from from God. So then, mm -hmm. that, remember, they had to build a temple for God's presence to come in and all that stuff. But that was all because of sin. So God became mm -hmm. flesh mm -hmm. so that he could save his people. So God knew that the world didn't understand him. They were in sin. They were lost. The Jewish people believed the verse, for hero Israel, Lord our God is one. They believed that, and they knew that he was the king of Israel. They were looking for him to come. But when Jesus came, they didn't believe that he was the one. So they, they didn't trust him. But after his death, burial, and resurrection, when he comes back, Israel will be in Israel for a thousand years. Then they will understand that he is God, and he will show it to his people clearly. But... But they're in darkness right now. They don't know. They don't have that light right now. They need to see the truth. So without, uh, without, without God, this world would be empty. So God became flesh for us. So God died and he rose again later. So remember the story of Saul when he was uh, uh, persecuting the Christians, remember? Uh, this is my perspective here. This is how I, my interpretation of it. Uh, Saul loved God, but Saul didn't like the false teachings when he thought. So this was a like a new religion, and Saul was against that. And he persecuted many Christians because he was blind about it. But God knew who he was, and he blinded him with a bright light and said, I am I am God, whom thou persecuted. <laughs> and he realized, I was blind all this time. I am so sorry. And his eyes were enlightened, and he understood the truth, that Jesus mm. is Yahweh. Jesus was God. So mm. he, from that point on, began preaching the truth. But God died for each and every one of us, and he loves you, and he wants you to reconnect with you. And the only way to connect is to be born again, and to receive that Holy Ghost. You have to call upon him, and, well, Jesus had to become flesh, and he had to die, and he had to suffer for our forgiveness, for our sins. And that was his plan. That was God's plan. He had to die to... And his blood was to save us all from our sins so that we could reconnect with him again and have life everlasting with him. So I have more, but I'm running out of time. Uh, perhaps I can save this and I can teach more, add more to it later. Mm. Uh, I have about four or five more 
actually so this part here before Abraham was I am I'll hold this for another time uh, as it, I just I taught for about an hour so this this is good everybody's satisfied with this <coughs> so do you mind coming to pray for closing now this was great teaching wow this is awesome I trust in this word of God I know there's only one God there's not a Trinitarian there's not three gods there's only one God. The Bible is so clear with that. Uh, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you to Christian Brother Jeff and the power of teaching about one God. We thank you for that. There's no other God besides you. Okay. Good job.